In the book of Luke now, we're studying the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's at the end of his ministry, and he's being badgered and frustrated by the religious leaders of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees. They're following him around, and they're trying to find a way to trick him or to get him pitted against their norms and their, their doctrines and dogmas and their hypocrisy. And uh, they're, they're following him around. I think this story probably begins in Luke chapter 14 where on the Sabbath day, this seems to be happening all in one day, a lot of things going on, and they're following around. But in Luke chapter 16, Jesus turns his attention to the disciples. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, they're listening, but he's speaking to his disciples. In Luke chapter 16, there's two things that happen. Number one, he gives this parable that we'll evaluate today. At the end of this chapter, he will tell a real story of a man named Lazarus, who has put his faith in Christ, but is a very poor person, and a rich man who is unnamed. It's not a parable. It's a story. It's a true story. Names are not given in parables. You'll see in the first parable here, he says, a certain man. But in, uh, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, they give a name. He's talking about a real hell and a real heaven. He's talking about a real eternity that... It, you, you can't, once you leave this world, I was uh, out in about 35 locations in Hammond this week. Uh, our people joined from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock on Thursday evening, and we walked different parts of our city in preparation, asking God to bring His power and His presence upon our city. 78,000 people there. And uh, I was walking with our son Mason and Brother Tim Benson and Brother Jerry Aguilar, and we walked the streets and went up and down the streets praying for God's presence upon our city. This week, we'll be going to the city of Merrillville and doing the same thing on Wednesday night when you come to church. I hope those of you who are in that region will take a card and go to a location and pray earnestly for that. Here's what you're going to feel. You're going to feel like you're wasting your time. I wonder who makes us think that. Well, I had to fight off uh, inertia to go, go visit someone, go talk to someone. But while I was praying, I was approached by a man named Kevin. And I, I approached him. I gave him a track once I started talking to him. And I said, Kevin, and I could tell he wasn't ready to go too much farther. But I said, I'll give this track. Do you mind if I pray with you, Kevin? He said, you know what? You have changed my disposition. I, I was ready to get on the phone and curse this and blank this and all this. He was just meeting you has really changed my, my, uh, my thinking this evening. I'm glad I got a chance to meet you. I said, well, let me have a word of prayer with you. I prayed with him. When I prayed with him, I said to, I said to the Lord, God, a hundred years from now, the only thing that's going to matter with me and Kevin is where we live, in heaven with you or in hell without you. And he went, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I never heard anybody say that before. He said, but I know that God is not going to hell. That's true. If you're in hell, you're going to be without God. He said, man, John, you got my head spinning. So I'm glad I met you tonight. He said, I don't remember what you just said, heaven with God or hell without him. But, well, that's really true. And uh, I, I also know here that God tells a real story. We're not going to get into it today. It will be next week. But the first part of the story is, is definitely to his disciples, but within earshot of the Pharisees, because they come at him really strong. The Bible uses the term derided him. They mocked him. They gave him a real hard rebuff and rebuke after he finished this story and he goes in and deals with their sin especially in the in the sin of marriage and divorce that he just gives a just a quick statement about that and and we can look at that another time but I want you to look real quickly at chapter 16 verse number one here's the story the Bible says and he said also to his disciples there was a certain rich man that had a steward or a manager that worked for him and the same was accusing to him that he had wasted his goods. So there's a man who's very wealthy, and he has probably multiple stewards or managers or foremen who oversee a part of his, his business. This man would live in the house owned by this rich man. He would get his wherewithal. He would feed his family from the money that was given to him. And he was one of his stewards, but... Word had gotten back to the rich man that this particular foreman, boss, manager, steward, was not doing a good job. He was wasting his money. 
He didn't know what he was doing. He was very negligent, lazy, and he wasn't doing well. So rich men don't stay wealthy ignoring such information. So let's see what the man does in verse number 2 of chapter 16. And he called him. He confronted this steward, this manager, this foreman. And he said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer steward. He said, what am I hearing about you? You're wasting my money. He said, I'm going to give you time. Get your books together. I want to see what you're doing with your time and with my money and my possessions. Because I'm thinking about firing you. I'm thinking about canning you from your responsibility. Because you may no longer be my steward. So now... There's a rich man. He's got information. He confronts his, his employee and his foreman and says, look, I'm really thinking about firing you. He said, I'll give you a little time. Get your act together. Come back. And when I call you in, we'll see if, if I'm going to keep you or not. Well, look at verse number three. Now we find the response of this foreman, this steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. He didn't even have a question about it. He goes, I'm going to get canned. <laughs> I am going to get fired. What am I going to do? Because I am going to lose my job when he talks to me again. I don't have the paperwork. I don't have a good excuse for why I've been so negligent. He goes, I'm going to, I'm going to get fired. What shall I do? And then he says, he says, you know what? I cannot dig. I don't know why he couldn't dig. Maybe he was old. Maybe he had a bad back. Maybe he was just very lazy. <laughs> He goes, I don't see myself digging and doing manual labor. And to beg, I would be ashamed to go around and say, my name is Jimmy. Take all you give me. I don't think it's going to happen. I've been a boss. I've been respecting this community now to go from being someone in charge. And my signature matters right now. I, I, I wear the boss's ring. I can go into the hardware store and put it down and sign on the bottom line and I can get stuff out of there. I can go places and represent the boss. And man, I can't imagine going to those same people that work at Home Depot and saying, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you? I can't beg. Well, then he comes to an idea in his mind. Look at the next thing the verse Bible says in verse number four. He says, I am resolved what to do. He goes, I know what I'm going to do. That when they put me out of the stewardship, they may receive me in their houses. He said, I'm going to get fired, and I won't have a place to live, and I won't have any food to feed my family. I won't have any money. He said, I think I know what I'm going to do. So that when I do get fired, at least for a little while, I'll have a place to live. I can take my kids, I can take my wife, I can take my family and move there, and I can live for a little while until I can get my act together. He said, I know what I'm going to do. Well, here is his sinister plan. Look, if you would, please, what it says in the next verse. Verse number five. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors. So the, the rich man, he called people that owed his boss money unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou to my Lord? So this is his plan. He calls everybody who owes his boss money and says, hey, guy, hey, if you owe my boss money, come in. I want to talk to you. I'm going to have a meeting with you. I need to talk to you. And he asked them one by one, how much do you owe my Lord? It's interesting. He didn't say, you owe my Lord this much. He has no clue. He's clueless. He doesn't have a ledger. He probably doesn't know. So he says to them, how much do you owe my Lord? How much, how much in debt are you to my boss? Well, look, let's look what happens here. Here, the first guy responded, well, in 100 measures of oil, that's about 8 to 10 gallons of oil is what I owe your, your um a measure would be about eight, ten gallons, so it's a, it was a lot, a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty instead of a hundred. He said he just cut, his, he just cut the, the, the bill in half. He said, how much do you owe, my Lord? He said, I owe him about a hundred measures of oil. And uh, he said, that's about eight hundred gallons of oil. He said, all right, look, give, give me your bill, give me your bill. Turn around, take it out, cross out a hundred and put fifty, and I'll sign it, and I'll put my boss's ring there. Now you only owe 50. Well, how would you like if you went and got your lunch this afternoon and the, and the waitress said, we're going to cut it in half? You'd say, you are wonderful. Well, if you went, to, you went to go get a car this week and it said the car is a used car, but you can get it for $10,000. And the guy said, you know what? Just give me $5,000. you are like, are you kidding me? 
You know what? Every that guy who got the fifty percent discount, that discount, he said, "I like you, man." So you're my friend. He probably said something like this: "You got to come over and bring the family and spend some time at our house together." And the guy's thinking, "Oh yeah, sooner than you think." <laughs> he, he might have said, hey, "You know what? You got to come over and eat lunch with us." He probably said, "Nah, not today, but next week I will." <laughs> he was thinking. And, but he didn't have time to mess with him. He said, next, how much do you owe my Lord? The next guy said, well, I owe him 100 measures of wheat. Look, if you would please, in verse number 7. He said, I 100 measures of wheat. And, and he said unto him, take thy bill and write four score. Let's change 100 to 80. Well, sure enough, one after the other, he gave all these brother-in-law deals to these people who own his boss and sure enough, they were all endeared. He ingratiated himself to them. And now everybody thinks he's the best thing since ice cream. They love this guy. I'm sure when he went up to McDonald's to get his coffee in the morning, someone said, his money's not good here. I'm taking care of this. He's my buddy. Everywhere he went, people said, hey, thanks for the deal. Well, you're unbelievable. You understand us. He gets us. He understands what we're going through. I imagine not only him, but probably his boss also started hearing about it. I'm sure as his boss maybe went someplace and got off his horse someplace or off of his wagon, people said, Mr., I really appreciate what you did for us and our family. You helped us so much. He's like, what did I do? He goes, oh, you don't know? You gave me half price on that thing. He goes, I did? <laughs> Who? And everybody kept pointing back to the same unjust steward. And the Bible says that the boss, he's a rich man. He doesn't, he doesn't like losing money, but the Bible says that man thought about that guy that worked for him, and I think he probably still fired him. But he said to him, that guy's pretty shrewd. That guy figured some things out. Look, if you would, please, what he said. The boss, um, verse number 8, can you read it with me? And the Lord, stop for a second, the Lord, is it capitalizing your Bible? So is it talking about Jesus or the, his boss? His boss. So this is not, this is not the opinion of God. This guy, was, this guy was irresponsible. He was lazy. He was uh, a shyster. But the Lord, his boss, commended the unjust steward. Continue reading with me, if you would, please. Because he had done, for the children in this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So the boss, after he found out all this, this clown was doing, and all the, how he made himself really popular in the short time that his ink pen and his signature mattered, while he still had the boss's ring, he said, you know, that guy's pretty shrewd. I got to hand it to him. He's pretty smart. He understood he's going to get canned. He's going to have to move out of my house. He's going to have to go feed his family, and he won't have my paycheck anymore to do that. And he went out and he made a whole bunch of friends so that when he got fired, he would have places to go. He said, that guy's pretty smart. Matter of fact, I don't know if it's Jesus who said this or the Lord, but he said this guy is wiser in his generation than the children of light. Who are the children of light, do you think, here? Christians. He said this guy was smarter, knowing that he was going to get canned and he needed some help. He at least made some friends while he had, while his signature mattered, while he had the opportunity to do so. So that when he would get fired, he would have friends that would let him into their home and house him until he got it, until in, in, the, in their habitation. He said, that guy's smart. And he's smarter than a lot of Christians. See, as a child of God, you and I have an inside track on future events. We know what's going to happen generally coming up in just a few short days. Jesus is coming again. He's going to come again. And you're going to see Jesus by death or by rapture. You're going to see Jesus, and then we're going to see God plan out his, and, and reveal what he's already planned out in the book of the Revelation. 
And if you're not here when the rapture comes, you're going to have a funeral. And you're going to leave this body that you're living in. I'll leave my body I'm living in. And we'll have to give an account to God. Now, we see that this is the story. Now, Jesus turns the story. So basically, a guy has uh, realized that he's going to get canned and pretty soon he's going to have to make arrangements. And so he goes out and makes friends with the ability, with the talents, with the treasure, with the authority, with the training that he has. He goes out and makes some friends so that when he gets fired, he can, he can have options. And they will receive him to, into their homes. Now we see that Jesus is done with the story, but he tells the application. Look at verse number 9, would you? And let's look at it, would you please? The Bible says, and I say unto you, this is Jesus picking up the application. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Mammon is the word for money, possessions. He said, go out there and make to yourself friends using your possessions. That when you fail, when you get fired from living, you die you go into eternity, they may receive you into where? Everlasting. Everlasting habitation. Homes that will live forever. It's interesting, this is one of the only times that God speaks about this in, this in these words in our English language. But Jesus did say, in my Father's house are many homes, mansions. And if I go, I'll come again receiving myself that where I am there, you can be also. So one thing we know about eternity future is there's habitations there. There's places that people live. And he says, I want you to use your time as his disciples. Now he's talking to his disciples there. He says, I want you to use your time, your talents, your treasure to make eternal friends so that when you die, they will gladly say, come to my home in heaven. Enjoy Eternity with me and our family and what God has got, what given to us through Jesus Christ. And enjoy that. He says, go out there and use your mammon. And it's interesting, God could have used anything there. But as I look at this story, several things come to my mind. Number one, um, life is a stewardship. You are, you, your stuff is really not your stuff. You are a steward, sir. You're a manager. That car in the parking lot, it's not really your car. Those kids that call you mom and dad are not really yours. Children are an heritage of the Lord. That home you live in, it's not really yours. Your health is not yours. All the things that you have been given and I've been given, they are a stewardship. In this life, God doesn't let us be owners. In the next life, I think there are things that are your own. In this life, you and I, on our best day, are managers of what God's given us. Number two, you're going to get fired. Someone else is going to drive your car one day. Someone else is going to turn the key to the house you live in. Everything we have, someone else will wear your clothes today. Someone brought me uh, three shirts, and uh, they were worn by another man, but they're nice. He didn't wear them very much because he didn't like them, but, he, but they're nice shirts. He said, I just don't like the style, and so he gave them to me. That man is on the precipice of eternity. He's not going to wear those shirts anymore, and when he got them, he might have thought, well, I'm going to wear this, or I'll do that. He said, no, I'm not wearing that, but I, I'm going to wear those shirts. And someone else is going to wear my shirt, my shirt, my shoes, and, and, and drive the car that I drive and live in the house that I live in because I'm getting fired one day from living. I'm going to get fired. The Bible tells us it's appointed unto every man once to die. And after that, that brings me to point number three. There is an evaluation awaiting all of us. You are going to be evaluated in what you did with what God gave you. I, I'm not responsible for what God gave you, and you're not responsible for what God gave me. Some things you're going to give an account for, and that's your time, what you did with your time, what you did with your talents, your strengths. Did you yield them to the Lord? Did you let God use your strengths for his eternal purposes? That's going to be important. Because whoever the owner is should have the ability to direct 
what he's given you. Your money, your treasure. I don't know how much money you have, and you don't know how much money I have, but here's one thing the Bible says. It takes money to make eternal friends. He said, I want you to use the mammon to make eternal friends so that when you fail, when you die, they will receive you into everlasting habitation. Your tribe, your family, your training, even your trials. You have trials that are unique to you, and I have trials unique to me. But the truth of the matter is, even what I've gone through, my hard days and your hard days, God wants you to use them for eternal purposes. Many of us, we've been helped by so many things. You're responsible for what you help. To whom much is given, much will be required. So he says, look, look, look John, I want you to remember, number one is that life is a stewardship. You're going to get canned from living. And you're going to give an account for what you did. And you know what? He will not need a prosecuting attorney. He's got all the evidence. He's the judge. He knows exactly what he gave me, and I will be responsible for that, and you'll be responsible for yours. So Jesus now finishes the story, and he turns his attention on some things we can do. He's going to talk about money. He's going to talk about management. And he's going to talk about masters. Money, management, and masters. Can you say it with me? Money. One more time. Money. He's going, to, he's going to say, Let, let's talk about this for a second. He said, first of all, he that is faithful to manage things that are little will be more faithful in things that are much. He said, I'm going to ask you, whatever you have now, you're responsible for that, the little things. He said, I want you to, the, the minute things of life, you need to be responsible for those. Kids, make your bed. Clean your room. Do a good job when your dad asks you to mow the lawn. Do, do a good job with that. Girls, when mom asks you to clean the, 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 the dishes, do it to the best of your ability. At work, whatever it is God's given us to do, that, oh, that's not a big thing. I don't get to do the best you can in the little things because God's watching how you handle and manage little things to give you larger things to handle. That's the first thing he says, look, in, 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 lieu, in lieu of my story I just told you, Jesus is telling us, he said, let me just give you advice. Be faithful in the little things. Number two, he said, I want you to be faithful in financial things. Money, mammon. Now, money is a big deal. We all have thought about it today. I imagine if I ask you how you thought about money and you asked me, we could exchange stories of how it happened. Maybe going by a gas a gas pump and saying, boy, gas has really gone up. Maybe it's in, in something that, that happened. All of us have thought about money today. How many could say, Pastor, I, I, I remember what I, what, when I thought about money today. Would you raise your hand already? The rest of you, you're just not thinking or you were asleep when I had just told you that. All of us have thought somehow about finances. Linda and I, we always sit together on Sunday morning. We pray and and we evaluate what God gave us, and we fill out our, our giving envelope together. So we always think about money on Sunday. And we think about it on Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday and Thursday. And if I'm up 24 hours or one hour, I think about it. It comes to my mind. He says, I want you to remember you're responsible for, you need to be faithful with money. He says, if someone isn't faithful with money, who would give them things that money cannot buy? True riches, influence spiritually, sweet kids. Listen, this is why it's so important that you evaluate this and your finances are very, very important because God sees how I handle finances. He says, I'm going to give you things that money can't buy. You know, money can buy a beautiful bed, but it can't give you a good night's rest. Money can buy the most expensive wedding, but it can't give you a good marriage. Money can pay the insurance premium that brings your baby home from the hospital, but it can't give you the wisdom you need to raise that baby. Those are true riches. Influencing people for the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and managing things that, that, can, uh, that can further the gospel and get people to Jesus Christ. That's true riches. How are you using it? He says, be faithful in your management. 
Be faithful in your money. And then he says, be faithful in the things that don't belong to you in this lifetime. And then I'll give you things that are your own. And then the last thing he says is be faithful with and understand you got two masters. Let's look at that verse 13. We read it and our time is up. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one, gravitate to the one, and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Well, you know, he says, look, you got to figure out. Money is a very good servant. It's a terrible master. You're going to have to find out, are you going to let God be your manager? Or you want to be, are you going to let God be the owner? Or you want to be the owner? And you've got to ask the Lord, what do you, how do you want me to do that? Because you can't serve one or the other. Especially, he pits money and Jesus and God in two different corners. Which corner are you going to live in? And, and he's teaching them a lesson. Now, I think he's teaching the disciples a lesson, but let me tell you, there are some people listening that are on a different page. The wealthy and the religious here are listening to this, and they don't like it. Let's see what they say in verse 14. Can you look at it with me, if you would, please? And the Pharisees also, who were what? You know, sometimes people don't like to hear stuff like this, and I don't know anybody in this room that's like that. But you know why it, it, it hits a nerve with us? It's because we have the itch for more that's overtaken us. We don't like it. We think there's an ulterior motive. We think God's against us, or, or we're trying to get something from someone trying to get us. He said, look, the Pharisees, when they heard this story, they were upset because they were what? They heard all these things, and they did what? They derided him. They, they, they mocked him publicly, rebuked him, scoffed him, made jokes about him. Look at this clown. And they began to deride him publicly out loud. Look at verse number 15. And he said unto them, Ye are, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. He said, You can make all the excuses you want to among yourselves. Okay. You've justified, but God knoweth your what? And where our treasure is, there are? For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And then verse 16, he says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. He said, we're, it's a different, there's a new sheriff in town. He said, it's a different time. The law and the prophets, that's the Old Testament. He said, but that's John. He said, and many of you, you're going headlong into the kingdom of God with great pressing or force. And actually, he's going to use the next verse to put his finger on the pulse of marriage and divorce, which they were doing very, very much at, at will. And we can talk about that another time. As you see this story, I want to ask you, where do, what does God want me to know from this story? And that is... Life is a stewardship. You're going to die, and you're going to give an account. You want to be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in your management. Be faithful in your money. And be faithful to the right master. Let's pray together, can we?